Okay, everybody, Boker Tov, sorry for the delay. Um, okay, we start the new and the final Masechet in Nezikin, Horiot, and actually, it makes a lot of sense what this Masechet is doing. I don't think we ever fully explained, or I really fully know what Avodah Zara is doing in Nezikin. Um, you know, maybe there were some of these things that there wasn't any good other place to put them. Um, but Horiot, at least, is a logical continuation of Sanhedrin, Mako, and Makos, because Sanhedrin and Makos, after you deal with the substantive laws, civil laws, you know, Sanhedrin and uh, and criminal laws, I guess, you know, Sanhedrin and Makos deal with um, uh, both, well, Sanhed- the Babas all deal with uh, the civil laws, Sanhedrin, part of it deals with like the laws that you get lashes and you have Misa, so all the various sort of laws in which Basin will punish for, and then it deals with all the, stru- the structures and the administrations of the court, that's Sanhedrin and Makos, and Horios, talks about what happens, also about the authority of the court. What happens if the court makes a mistake in ruling? I mean, it tends to start more with issues about Isra Veheter, like a classic example is if they say certain kosher fat, is a tra- non-kosher fat, chalev is shuman is kosher and so on. But it also gets to, you know, other areas as well. And about the sacrifice that they bring, the special sacrifice, if they rule incorrectly. And then it gets to the questions about a Kohen Gadol and the, the Zake Mamre, the person who rebels against the authority of the courts. So Horius is actually a nice, it is about authority and institutions of authority and, and legal authority in general, political authority and so on. It's a nice continuation of some heaven and Mako. It's a very short Masechet. It's the shortest Masechet. Um, there's also, if you'll notice, that every daf sort of is, the Rashi is really on both sides of the page. The Tosos is assigned to, like, the margins. Um, the thing here that's called Tosos is a very, very short Tosos. The Tosos for Rush, which has also been put here as a more standard size Tosos. Um, so anyway, if I quote from Tosos, it'll most often be the Tosos for Rush. There's not a lot of who showed him on it. Um, but it is an interesting one in terms of like the political, you know, sort of uh, thinking of the rabbis. Okay, so with that, let's get started. First mission here on Bet Abdalif. Um Based in, the uh, Horror based in Lav, where Allah has called Mizas from Rosh Torah. Based in ruled to say that somebody, um, can, uh, that a, that one of the myths wrote, um, they said that you could actually tra- violate something. They didn't actively say it's permissible to violate something. They interpreted a law in a way that would lead to something that they should have been understood to be prohibited. They actually said, oh, in this case, it's okay. Like, let's say they actually said, um, they were questioning about what type of the fat of the behema, the chelev, is that that the Torah forbids. And they actually said that, like, you know, the fat over here is not a problem. Problem. It turned out they made a mistake. That fat actually was forbidden. Um, or another example, let's say they said, only means if you actually use the mother's milk. If you use some other milk, it's okay. Okay, so they actually said that something that would have been forbidden, actually they interpreted the law in a way that it turned out it was permissible. And they're making a mistake. So I should again say that the the the, the beginning of Horiot focuses on like two parshiot in the Torah. One is in Dvarim, which is the case of Zaki Mamre, which is the case about somebody who rebels and rejects the authority of the court. And the other is the case about what happens if if they rule incorrectly and somebody uh, follows them, or the community follows them, the tzibur, all of Israel follows them, and they have to bring a korban for the for the guilt for the for having ruled incorrectly and misled the tzibur. So first of all, just holding the two of those in juxtaposition is interesting because the idea that you would kill a zaki mamre, you'd execute a zaki mamre, somebody had the temerity to reject the authority of the court, right, is an idea that like, oh, you know, the court is right regardless. Like the court has absolute authority. Nobody dare, you know, rec- you know, reject their authority and you know, or challenge their authority. And then on the other hand, you have the idea that. Uh, an acknowledgement that they can make a mistake and be responsible for the mistakes of uh, you know of what everybody does because they recognize that they make a mistake, okay? And we're actually going to see in our mission, and it's particularly ironic when you think about the idea of Zaki Mamre, that if somebody realizes they're making a mistake, they're not supposed to listen to Bastin. So on the one hand, if you if you sort of like you know publicly defy their authority and put yourself up as an opposing authority, and you go around and preach to people, they're wrong, they don't know what they're talking about, listen to me, and so on, then you're a threat to the system, and we're going to execute you, that's a Zaki Mamre. But if basically, privately, you think they're making a mistake, and you don't listen to them, and you do what you think is correct, and you're in a position that that judgment is actually one that's a meaningful judgment, it's not like you just stomped some shit of schmo off the street, you know, 
then actually that's what you're supposed to do, and you're not supposed to listen to them if you sort of. So those are like very interesting, just to sort of juxtapose that, to juxtapose the idea that on the one hand we're going to execute somebody, so we want to insist on the authority of the court, and the other hand we acknowledge the fact that we can make a mistake. The other thing that I should just mention at the outset, which is fascinating about this, is the idea that there's such a thing as an objective mistake. Since the, you know, like what would it mean if, let's say, the Supreme Court decided, oh, we misread the Constitution, and here, just to take it to contemporary example, we realized that actually for the last 200 years, there was no right to bear arms. It was only permissible in the context that if you're actually doing it as part of a militia, okay? You know, um, so does that mean that for the last 200 years they ruled incorrectly? No, it was an old interpretation of the Constitution and a new interpretation of the Constitution. So it's allowed to be a new rule without basically defining that what had passed was a mistake, right? And normally, I think we would tend to think that the rabbi's role in interpreting the Torah would be the same. If at one stage they said, don't cook a goat in its mother's milk, meant literally that, and later they said, no, it means in general meat and milk, we, or they did the reverse, Right, they wouldn't, whatever it is, we wouldn't say, oh, for the past 2,000 years, people were eating non kosher food. We would say that was an old interpretation, this is a new interpretation. At least that's what we moderns would say. Okay, the very fact the Mishnah deal with an idea that they could have made a ruling and people followed them, and then they said, actually, we made a mistake, here's what the verse should have meant, you know, and that defines the past as a mistake. That is itself fascinating from a perspective of the rabbi's role in interpreting the Torah. And do we think there's such a thing as some sense of like an objective meaning that they could get wrong? Okay, so anyway, so those are, I mean, they're really fascinating concepts here. So let's take a look. So it starts with saying that they interpreted a law and they gave a ruling that, that said that some transgression was permissible. And a person and an individual followed them, and he went and he listened to them, and he therefore unintentionally erred, and, um, you know, and let's say he ate this forbidden fat. Now, the reason we give the example of forbidden, you know, let's give a more contemporary example, or uh, immediately contemporary, comments to Pesach. It has to be something that, that under other circumstances you would bring a sin offering. Okay, so if you actually thought something was matzah and it turned out that it was uh, chametz, okay, that's a schaif kare, so whatever was a shogi, you'd bring a korban, a chatos, okay, and if the basin says, this thing here is actually matzah, and it, I mean, not just a particular thing, certain types of, of bread made in a certain way is matzah. Okay, and everybody goes and eats it, and everybody's thrilled, and so it's a Pesach, and we're having this stuff that tastes delicious. Mm -hmm. And then after Pesach, they tell us, oh, whoops, we made a mistake. It was real. It was really chomet. Okay, so now, if we had done that as individuals, we would bring the korban chatas. If the whole seaboard, the majority of Klaus, were listens to them, they bring the korban. That's what we're going to get to. Okay, so now we're dealing with, though, this case where they ruled it. If the, everybody listens to them, Basin brings the korban. You don't have everybody when they realize they're wrong. Now, but you don't have everybody listening to them. You have a few people listening to them, okay? And they're eating this stuff. And then after Pesach, they say, whoops, that was chametz. So since it's not the majority of Kla Yisrael, Basin is not going to bring the korban. What about the individuals? Do they have to bring the korban, right? They didn't do anything wrong. They just listened to Basin. So you would think they're totally blameless, and nobody brings the korban here. So that's what this mission says. He goes ahead and he follows their ruling, even though it's going to turn out to be a wrong ruling. Whether he ate the chum, they, they went ahead and they ate this chametz first, and then he followed them, which certainly makes him blameless. They actually, in practice, ate this stuff. Okay? Or they did it, so... Um, um, whether so, whether he did it together with them, they all decided let's have a nice meal, okay? And he, they invited him, okay? Or whether they first did it and he followed them, they also, also, even if they didn't eat it, they just issued their ruling. The asa and he did it, okay? Nevertheless, in all those cases, whether they acted or not, as long as they gave the ruling, patur, he has no blame. He don't He relied on them. They're the legal authority. So even if they afterwards issue a statement that they made a big mistake, okay? They don't bring a korban because it's not the majority of the tzibor, and he doesn't bring it because he's an individual. Now, Now they gave that ruling, but one of the members of the court knew that they were making a mistake. He was yelling at them and telling them, maybe got up and said, let the walls of the base medrash bend in. Okay, he was telling them that they got it wrong. Okay, and he knows they're making a mistake. Oh, Tommy, who Roy Lohra, or even if he's not actually a member of the court, he's like a clerk of the court. 
but he is somebody that is up the level that in theory he could be on the court. We're talking here, by the way, I should make it clear, this basically means the Sanhedrin Haggadol, the central authority of the Jewish people, okay? The Halakha Vasapi. So I know they're making a mistake, but I say, look, at the end of the day, they're the court, they have the authority. I'm going to follow them and I'll eat this stuff, even if in my heart I know that it's chametz. They said it was it was it was matzah, and I'm going to eat it. So whether whether I did it together with them, or they did it first and I followed them, or they didn't do it at all and I just went ahead and ate it. In that case, I actually do have to bring a korban. At the end of the day, I didn't say I'm relying on them because I actually felt that they were making a mistake. So therefore, since at the end of the day, that I cannot claim that I actually am a shogun. Now that's interesting, because again, it gets to this question of absolute truth. Like I might be able to say, look, if I think that they're making a mistake, um, that I, they, maybe they made a mistake. Like maybe I think that the Supreme Court has been wrong for the last 200 years, how they're interpreting the Second Amendment, you know, but it doesn't mean that that's not the law of the land, right? So whether I think they're making a mistake or not, if they interpret it that way, maybe that's the law. So again, what we get to the point is, is that there is some sense here, it's not spelled out how, maybe many cases that's true, that it's an open interpretation and whatever they say goes. But there are some cases at least where there's a sense that it's an objectively wrong psaac, okay? And therefore, and therefore it is not a legitimate halacha even after they issue that ruling. And therefore that's true and I know that, I believe that to be the case, I mean, it doesn't mean I know it, I believe that to be the case, that they're wrong, I cannot say that I'm relying on their authority. It is, even after they said it, it's not the law, and if I'm going to go ahead and do it, then I'm going to knowingly be breaking the law, and I would have to read the Quran. Now, the Gemara is going to ask, then I should be amazed. Like, if I know it's the wrong ruling, and I'm doing it anyway, so we'll get to that. Okay? But anyway, so that's the case. Is that cloud is the rule? Um, if you're relying at the end of the day on yourself, you're not sort of saying they know better than I do. You actually do think they're wrong then you bring a korban. Hatolu Bebeistin, if you're relying on them, Hatur, then you are exempt from a korban. At the end of the day, you're following them. Yes. Isn't it going to cause some confusion if some people are doing it one way and other people are doing it another way? Well, yeah, I mean, that gets to, well, first of all, the number of people that actually would not listen, first of all, would not listen to the court would be small because it would only be the people that were like on the based in oh, themselves okay. or fit to be on the based in. But the question also what we're dealing here mostly, since we're talking about doing an active Avera, to not listen to the court means just to be passive. You know what I mean? It means like, so fine, I won't eat that on Pesach. I'll eat my, my normal matzah on Pesach. You know, so it's not like I'm actively doing something different. It just means I'm choosing, this thing they said was a permissible act, I'm just choosing not to do it. So that's also, now, but, but the other question, of course, is, like I said, reading this alongside the whole idea of a Zaki Mamre, because mm -hmm. the whole problem of a Zaki Mamre is somebody who actively defies the authority of the court. And of course, the person who's actively defying the authority of the court believes in his mind that he's totally right and they're totally wrong. So isn't that this person? And part of the difference is exactly this, is that the Zaki Mamre goes out and preaches to everybody and sets himself up as an opposing authority. This guy just personally is making a private choice, you know, not to do it, okay? It's now, if this guy said like, oh my God, this is Chometz, I can't eat this, and then I'm gonna, he's gonna go around and tell everybody, don't listen to him, don't listen to him, it's Chometz or whatever, right? That's a problem. Because then he's not just acting as a pro, you know, then he's, so it's a funny, you know, you could say he's trying to save them from mm -hmm. the but nevertheless, that's where it crosses a line and becoming a competing authority with the court. Yeah, it reminds me a little bit of kosher in Israel. Yeah. Where, like, um, my theory was always, if the Rabbanut says kosher, I don't ask questions. Right. And a lot of people, they say the Rabbanut is a certain, like, ambiguous baseline. Right. But if you look behind the scenes, you'll find out that a lot of, the things aren't really kosher. right, right, right. The question is, it's kind of do you just follow the rabbi, right, 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 or do you like go in and right, find and how much you have to, toy him right, 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 right. Kind of that's a good question, it's like yeah, a yeah, yeah, yeah. Central authority is like giving like um, your stamp of approval, stamp of approval. and how exactly yeah. and how much does that free you from responsibility? Yeah, what do, do, is a lay person ever in a position about like Tommy Veroy Lahora? Because let's yeah. say the question about their error isn't about the halacha, but it's about the facts, right? And then, right? And so, so, right, but let's say in this case of the Mishnah, let's say they made a certain assessment that a certain thing was permissible, and you said like, yeah, but I'm a doctor, or mm -hmm. I'm a scientist, and I know they misunderstood the facts, 
right? So maybe that would be a case where you're not worried to be on the base in, but you also can't be totally mm. behind them. And what you're talking about is an example where a lay person right now doesn't actively know they're wrong, but maybe they're in a position to do a little bit of digging and investigation and how much does that shift the sense of where the responsibility lies? Yeah. That's an excellent question. Yeah, it's an excellent way of sort of framing this issue. When are you totally ba'atzma and when are you totally based in? So let's take a look. Amr Shmuel. Basin is not chayav. Now, it's funny, what does he mean when he says chayav? We're talking about the individual being patur. But for now, we're assuming they're two sides of the same coin. Or that when, a, when If the majority of the community, list of, the, of, of like the Jewish people listen to the basin, then and they sin, then the basin brings a korban. Okay, so when basin makes a wrong ruling, minority who listens to them according to our mission is exempt. And then nobody brings the korban. Majority they bring the korban, and therefore the question is: by framing both of those cases, when is it considered that the individuals are following them? When have they issued an official ruling, and the individuals are following them? Both for the individuals to be exempt, and when the individuals become the majority, for them to be chayav. So Shmuel says that state that that they gave an official ruling, and then it exempts the individuals and obligates them if it's a majority, is only if they say the word "you are permissible," meaning the word is aten. They're not saying in the abstract. In, it would be permissible for a person to blah, blah, blah. That's like a theoretical statement, okay? It, it is permissible for you, okay? This is permissible for you, okay? It is permissible for you to do this. They have to have that active word to do it. Otherwise, it's still a theoretical point, you know, that, that they're sort of saying it. Now, the Tosus Rush discusses that they might not need um, the magic word, it might context could matter. If I come to the basin and it says, here's my case, da, 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 is it permissible for me to eat this fat? And they say, yes, it's permissible. They might not need to say last, so it's clear they mean that I have a concrete case, and they're giving me a ruling and I'm going to act on it. But it's different. So that's what the last sod is doing, that they're responding to a concrete situation. And that makes it a real ruling and a practice. Okay. As opposed to if they just sort of say, you know, like in general, like it's like somebody's writing a chuva. You ask me a question, I say, yes, it's permissible for you to do this. As opposed to if I'm like writing a safer halacha and I'm talking about in, like laying down the general parameters, but I'm not giving a concrete specific ruling. Okay, and that becomes a whole discussion in the Gemara. Like, you know, when some Gemara says that you're not supposed to follow it when somebody says halacha, ad yomar halacha limaaseh. It's not just that they're saying that this is the ruling, but this is the ruling for it to in practice. And sometimes a posek is a little bit hesitant, it's like he's making a big chiddush, and he doesn't want, and he wants to sort of say like, I believe in theory this is the law, but I'm not 100% ready to say you should do it. We'll say, lahalacha the lo lemaaseh. Like this is the law that I believe is correct, but I'm not yet saying to act on it, okay? So therefore they say you need either the words or the context or the concrete case to make it clear that this is a ruling meant to be acted upon. And only then can you say that the individual is following them and, and all these special rules kick in. My time of why? It's not finished yet. It hasn't been made clear that it's to be acted upon until that word or that context is there. Amar Baya, Baya said, So we have other evidence that you need that active verb to make it a real binding sort of relevant ruling. Okay? So here's the case about what makes somebody a Zakin Mamre, the rebellious elder. So he voiced his opposition and then he went back to his own town. If he continues teaching, like he says, look, the basin rules that this is the thing. I think that the following should be the right law. Okay, so if he talks about it and he's just talking about it more in theory, he's not a Zuck in Mamre. If he says, this is how you should act, you should listen to me, that's when he's a Zuck in Mamre. So the key word being is La'asot. Not just this is the law, but this is how you should act. Okay? Um... Uh, five. A woman has a testimony of one witness that her husband died. So in that type of case, it's only one witness. There's a certain sense of that uh, she might be responsible if the witness is wrong or it requires the special license of Basin. So if Basin went and told her, fine, we accept the testimony of this one witness, it's permissible for you to remarry. And then she went, and rather than remarrying, she just had sex with another man outside the context of marriage. Okay, now you should say implicit by saying it's permissible for you to be married is that we are deciding that your husband is dead. 
but she doesn't have an explicit license of the court to have sex. She only, generally, she only has a license of the court to remarry, right? So even though implicit in their ruling is their decision that the husband is dead, their practical permission, their practical, what they're telling her she's allowed to do is remarry. She's not, they're not telling her she's allowed to have sex outside of marriage. And therefore, she has sex outside of marriage, and then it turns out that the husband is alive, then it's considered that she committed adultery. You understand this? She gets married to a second guy and had sex with the second guy, and the husband is alive. She didn't commit adultery. Well, she did, but she's she's like you know blameless. But it turns out that the that that she had sex outside of marriage and the husband was alive. Then she's she's blameworthy for having committed adultery. So even though when look in theory. What's implicit in what they're saying is X, Y, Z. It doesn't matter. They haven't actually given you active permission to do that. Okay, so it's not considered a real ruling that you can say that you are acting based on you know their ruling, and therefore you're not acting on your own unless the ruling explicitly says here is what you are allowed to do. Okay, so. Um, um, so also, so obviously this is why it's circling back. That's also our Mishnah. So the it says so They didn't say they horu about a mitzvah that something was permissible. They said they were. They told you that you could do this act, and it turned out that that act was a transgression. That's sort of the end of it. All of this Tanaitic evidence proves that it's only considered a psak of basin if they say halacha lim maaseh. Okay, they actually give you an explicit ruling. I have to tell you, like it's true even nowadays, you see it in like a couple, you know, it's rare that uh, people, like in America, in Israel it's very common. In America it's much rarer that people write to vote, you know, that people actually write practical rulings. And even in Israel, some people complained that there were some recent books that came out, re actually very good halacha lamasa books, Sfarim that came out, but that at the end they don't say, here's the halacha. You know, here's, in this case, you're the, you are allowed to do this. Don't do this, do this, etc. They don't say this. They sort of say, here are the different opinions. Like, they talk more theoretical than really taking the full responsibility, mm -hmm. even though it's clear what they want to be saying, right? But they don't actually say, in this case, it's permissible for somebody to do X. They sort of say, like, you know, you know, the consensus of the post scheme is that the following thing is permissible. You know, you're talking in the abstract, but you're not actually saying you are allowed to do that. And that's actually saying that, yeah, that is the full taking of responsibility of the court, but that's also what fully gives, as it were, license to the individual in these various types of cases. Okay? Um, well, you don't have a court today. So you, know, you would rely on a, a post scheme to, uh, you could do that. You could say, if he gave me this permission. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the same type of thing happens. You know, I'm relying on this post sake and, you know, and then it becomes like, okay, if you know better, I and mean, if you think they're making a mistake and you're a position to judge, that's the case about Roy Lasso. But if you're not, you know, in a, in a position to know better and to judge, then yeah, you're just following them. I mean, we'll see a little bit more about this about, but presumably that makes you look you're blameless. You know, you're just following the psaac that you got. Okay, so now the Gemara says like, but it is interesting, this, diff this line between a theoretical discussion and actually taking the responsibility of saying, no, I'm telling you you're allowed to do it. Rest on my authority. You're allowed to do it. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, da, 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 fine. Now the question is like this. Um, you know, that also gives like, you know, it's like the Zakin Mamre, the out. Like he can say, I'm not telling anybody to do it. I'm just telling them this is what I think the halacha is, you know? <laughs> All right. But that's like I said, you see that phenomenon nowadays. We're just talking about in theory. Okay. Anyway, he can tell me. Um, Shmuel says that they have to say Lasot, like we said before. I'm sorry, it reverses it. It has Shmuel, Shmuel being the one who says you have to say Lasot. Rav Dimi says you don't have to be that explicit, even if you just say that this is that this is permissible without sort of ex explicitly saying you may do this. That itself can, is uh, sufficient. And now it's going to say everything we quoted before as a proof. Now we're going to show as a contradiction because all the evidence shows that you need to say la sot. We didn't teach that way. If you're just teaching the law, you're exempt. As a zakimami, the rebellious elder. If you say you can do this, act this way, then chayav, you're chayav. I'm Rabbi Abba. We didn't teach that way. If they permitted her to remarry, then she's not, a, and she has sex outside of marriage, then she's chayav a korban, because that's operating outside of the explicit ruling of Bastin. So that shows you that it's not enough that they, what's implicit in their ruling. It's only when they make it explicit what you're allowed to do. 
Okay, same as our Mishnah, all of this evidence shows that the full hora is not when they say halacha, but when they say halacha lim ma'aseh. Okay, moving on now. So now the individual listens to them um, and he follows them unwittingly. Okay, and why doesn't just say the person listens to them? Shogeg lamali, what does it mean he does it? you know, unwittingly, and he follows them. Shogeg, the classic shogeg is a case where I accidentally do an Aveyor and I think it's, you know, whatever. So why why use the word shogeg? Why not just say the person follows them? So the Gemara says, Amar Rava, shogeg lasuri ho basin shechelev mutter, v'nischalev lo chelev b'shuman v'achalo pater. Okay, apiam, apiam mamash. So he says, because there's a classic case of shogeg. What's a classic case of shogeg? Classic case of shogeg is, okay, this here is chelev, is forbidden fat, and this here is shuman, is, uh, what do you call it, is kosher fat, okay? And I actually, you know, know that I have some kosher fat here, and I stick my hand, and I pick up this, and I eat this, thinking it was the kosher fat. In that case, I accidentally did an avera, I ate the wrong thing, and I would bring a korban. Okay, that's a classic shogun. Now, that's what shogun normally implies, is something of that. I was a certain degree negligent, I should have been careful. Okay, fine, it has nothing to do with basic. Now, let's say we have exactly this scenario, except this non-kosher fat here, Basin actually ruled it was okay. Okay, so in this case, I went to eat the shuman, I accidentally ate the chelev, but this is chelev that even had I known that it was what it was, I would have eaten it because Basin gave my gave the ruling. So in that case, what do we say? We say I'm shoge because in my act I was not consciously following Basin. I was trying to eat this. So in the end of the day, I ate this. But maybe, maybe it's only considered to be not my act. Now I'm not responsible if in my mind I'm following Basin because then you could say that action was all just a part of Basin's ruling. You know, it was, in, it was following, it was an outcome of Basin's rule. It's almost like Basin told me to do it. Don't look at me, look at them. Okay? That's when I consciously ate this. That's when I'm putter. But let's say I accidentally ate this. I was trying to eat this. Then maybe ironically, even though I've now made a double mistake, maybe ironically I'm chayo. Arguably, I would have eaten it even without Basin's involvement. The fact that I, the schelev has no... Has right, had they not the ruled, side. that's a good way of saying it also. Yeah. Meaning, had, I, had they not ruled, I would have eaten it anyway. Uh, because accidentally, uh, anyway. yeah, yeah. their ruling did not make me eat it, right? As opposed to when I'm consciously, their ruling made me eat it, is the reason I'm eating it. So here, their ruling is not the reason I'm eating it, and therefore, it should basically be just considered it's my act. Accidental, I'm not amazing, I'm in a korban, but I don't get to shirk, I don't get to dis sort of disassociate myself from the act, right? Because as it was it was said very well, like it's not like I would have this would have happened had it even had not been for their ruling. But in the case when it only happened because of their ruling, I would say, Don't look at me, look at them. So that's the question. In that case, do I bring a korban or not? So that's what Rava, Rava is saying is the reason it says shogeg, a pihem is to tell you two cases. One case of shogeg that after their ruling, I accidentally ate the wrong piece. And the other case was I consciously did it because of their ruling. And he actually says, in both cases, actually, you are exempt. Because at the end of the day, right, their ruling would have been sufficient to have had me eat this piece. All right? So Rava says, so that's what Rava says is the Mishnah's teaching here. Um, now, Nilsa de Pshita Rava, now this thing that was obvious to Rava, um, uh, I'm sorry, the I mean, others say, um, Amarava, Shoge Gapiyam, who the Potter, no, it's telling you the exact opposite. That it's only when your error is a res- directly a result of their ruling. If you accidentally got the pieces mixed up, Chayav, then you're hired because your error would have happened, you would have eaten it regardless of their ruling. Now, Yosef de Pshitale, the Rava, the thing that Rava himself was obvious according to this version, okay, well, when either of them, Kamibayle, the Rami Barkamo. So we have two versions. Either for Rava, it's obvious that you're exempt in that case, or it's obvious that you're Kaya. But, okay, so there's two different versions of what Rava said. But either way, Rava had a clear position on this. Rami Barkama did not have a clear position on this. The by Rami Barkama, because Rami Barkama asked, Horu Basin Shechelev Mutter, and Yitzchali Shwebu Shuman. Basin ruled that this piece of fat was forbidden and was permissible, and he accidentally ate it. He was trying to eat a different thing. Vachalo, Mahu. So what's the halacha? So he asked it as a question. Rami Barkham didn't know. And now Rava tries to resolve it. I'm a Rava, Tashma, come and not live here. Halach Yachid Vasa Shogi Gapian. Shogi Gapian Lamali. What's this extra word accidentally following them? Why didn't you just say following them? 
Lav lasi her basin shechelu muter means chalu for chelu b'shem rachalu patur. So doesn't it mean that so that even when he is eats accidentally eats the wrong piece, he's also exempt after their ruling? So no, the yoma shogeg apim u depater. No, maybe only the weeding is not shogeg or apim, but a shogeg that's only because of what they said. Only when he is actively following them is when he's exempt. But if he's actually getting it mixed up, and he would have done it regardless, accidentally, but he would have done it regardless, he's chayev. Ikadamri, some say, Amarava, Ravas tried to resolve it the other way. So now reading this as one phrase, not as two phrases. Only when the error is directly as a result of their ruling. But if it gets, the pieces get mixed up, he's chayav, because it's not a result of their ruling. Uh, um, so, so the Gemara says, no, not necessarily. Maybe either or. So basically, you can read the Mishnah either way. There's an extra word, shogeg, in the Mishnah, but it could come be, there's two ways to read it. It's coming to tell you either A or not A. You know, we just don't know which one of them. Okay, Piplukta. Now, this issue is actually a debate. We'll see if Rav and Reb Yochanan. Basin Shechilev Mutter. In Chalapo Chelev Bishim, in exactly this case. Vachaloni. Rav Amar Pater. He's exempt. Since he'd be exempt by listening to Basin, and he'd be exempt by, then he, he, since he'd be exempt by listening to Basin, so here too, even though he got it mixed up, he, you can't, you know, it'd be something he would have eaten anyway. Reb Yochanan, now Reb Yochanan says, Chayav. He's Chayav. Because even without their ruling, he would have eaten it. Okay, so therefore, um, now Mesve, I'll ask you on this. It's a bright there. It says if a person from the people of the land does a sin, they have to bring a korban. This is a classic verse of like the classic part of the Torah of where an individual brings a korban for a sin. Okay, so what does it mean from the people of the land and presumably not all of them? Prat limumar. This is excluding the case of a apostate, somebody who has rejected. Like if somebody basically says, I I don't believe in this whole chalev nonsense, I eat chalev regularly. I eat buster b'chalev regularly, okay? So that type of a person that has completely rejected and now rejected it, here's a guy that basically, here, we'll use a more contemporary example, chametz for Pesach. Somebody never keeps Pesach. They always eat chametz on Pesach. Now today, but, you know, Lela Seder, they figured, all right, I'll try to do this thing, I'll eat some matzah. And they were going to eat some matzah and accidentally they ate chametz. Okay, so that person does, and now they have regret. Did they bring a korban? Okay, for eating chametz. So the answer is no. Since you basically have rejected the whole thing altogether, and you would have eaten chametz had you even had you known it was chametz. Okay, therefore, even though here that you ate it accidentally, you're not going to bring a korban. Okay, a korban. You got it. So that's the person who's rejected this category of law. He is going to not bring a korban, even if he accidentally sins in this area. Prat lumumer. Reb Shimon Yosi Omer, Reb Shimon, Reb Shimon, in a Tzarech Ari Omer, no, you can get it from a different verse. Asher lote asena bishkaga, if a person does a sin that, that you should not be done, but the way, in error, and the way this is reading, his reading is, he otherwise would not have done, but he's only doing it because he made a mistake. Okay? Prat vasham, oh hoda, hashav mi diyato me bi korban, somebody who had known would not have eaten it, that's the person who brings a korban. Okay? Al Shigasa, Lo Shamidiato, somebody who even had he been informed would have gone ahead and done it. Ain't a maybe korban al Shigasa, does not bring a korban when he makes a mistake. So, my example, the guy who said, Wait, 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 stop, that's chametz you're eating, it's not matzah. This is the guy who would have said, I don't care, I eat chametz al Bezad anyway. Okay? So, that person would not bring a korban. So, it sounds like they're both basically having the same ruling, just learning it from a different verse. There is a slight difference, which the Gemara elsewhere explores, that the idea of Mumar basically excludes the whole person. You as a person will never bring a korban for those types of sins because you have re rejected and you're a Mumar. As opposed to in this particular act, you ha even had you known better, you would have done it. And focusing on the act is helpful for us in our case. Because in our case, you're actually a tzaddik. You're not a mumar. You listen to everything based in says. Okay? So in this case, where these things got mixed up, right? And you ate this, but you, you were trying to eat this, uh, excuse me, you're trying to eat this, which is the shuman, and you accidentally eat the chaylev. So in that case, you're a total tzaddik. You do everything right. If I was like, wait, right? Based in actually ruled that this is actually, this is actually chaylev, but based in ruled it's permissible. So that, so you would have eaten it anyway, right? You get it? This is a case where, had you known the facts of what Basin ruled and that you were eating chayla, but Basin ruled it, okay, you would have done it anyway. So 
So it's, not, media. it's not that you would have done it anyway because you're such a Russia. You would have done it right. That's the other case. Here you would have done it anyway because Basin gave a ruling and you're willing to listen to Basin. So you're not a shove mediato. You're not a person who, had you known better, would have stopped doing what you're doing. So that's the argument that you should not bring a korban. Okay, in this case of the Basin's ruling, you would not have to bring a korban. Why? Because ultimately, even though you weren't actively following Basin. You, ha you would have been prepared to have eaten it, given Basin's ruling, and therefore you don't bring a korban, okay? So that's the, that's the logic. So that should be support the position of Rav, that you don't bring a korban. Vim Isa, and if it's what Rabbi Yochanan said is correct, halo shavmi diyasohu. In this case, it's not, why how could Rabbi Yochanan say you're chayv a korban? Even had you known that you were eating a chaylev, you wouldn't have stopped eating it. So Amr of Papa says Rav Papa because Rav Yochanan kimen dechim yisyadu lulu beidina hadri behu vunami hadri be because since now we're talking about theoretically right we're talking about theoretically had you known better would you have done it or not so as long as we're talking about theoretically let's theorize some more theoretically had Basin become aware that they made a mistake and you would have known da, 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 then you wouldn't have done it right so meaning yes. Had you been aware partially that this was Chalev, you might have done it because given Basin's ruling. But ultimately, you're somebody who wishes you wouldn't have done this because had you really had Basin found out they made a mistake and would have tracked the ruling, then you wouldn't have wanted to do it. So, even the Kimisiyadu Leila Beidina Hadribu, since once became aware to the Basin, they would have reversed. Bunami Hadri Be Shavi Diaso Karina Be Vichayev. He is somebody that ideally would not have wanted to do it. What Yochanan says is, when are you chayv a korban? That you made a mistake and you did something that ideally you wouldn't have wanted to have done. So this is the case, as opposed to the guy who's actively rejects and says, I'm ready to eat chametz. Ideally, I would have been happy to eat chametz, okay? So from the subjective perspective. That's a person who doesn't bring a korban. But you ideally wish you wouldn't have eaten this piece. Why? Because even though right now, Basin has ruled it's okay, in the end of the day, we're going to find out that they made a mistake. And therefore, ideally, you wish you wouldn't have eaten it. Okay, so therefore you do bring a korban. I'm a rava, Moda Rav. You didn't know that the court made a mistake at the time. Right. So you're being held responsible to bring a korban. For right. That you exactly. Could but not the better possibly way, have known. Right. But the better way to see this, and this will become clearer in a minute, is that this is not an issue of fault, of guilt. Okay. It, I mean, one of the ways of understanding it is just a question of like, who are we ascribing the act to? Right. So therefore, since you are not acting given based on Basin's ruling, right, even without Basin's ruling, you would have eaten this forbidden piece or whatever. At the end of the day, it was your it was your act. So the fact that in theory you would have listened to Basin and eaten it anyway, right, is is not enough to basically disassociate you from ha from from the act. But yeah, I mean, again, if you think about issues about fault and guilt or whatever, it's, it's it doesn't exactly work. But you, that's not the only way we're measuring this. In this case, if you had, let's say, exactly 50% of the people followed Basin and ate this chaylev, consciously eating this chaylev, okay, because knowing that Basin gave the ruling. Now, as soon as it's 50% plus one person, Basin is going to bring a korban because the majority of the people listen to them. You're that one person. You're that one vote. And you go ahead and you eat this. This, not because you're consciously following their ruling, because you accidentally ate the wrong piece of meat. Okay, so maybe you would have done it had you known that it was chaylev, but accident you were really trying to eat something else. Okay, so even if we say that you personally are exempt because in theory, from according because in theory you would have been prepared to follow their ruling, since it's not you, you're not actively following their ruling. You don't combine with the other 50% of the people to now say that, that a majority of the people followed Basin's ruling. Okay, in this case, you theoretically would have listened to them, but you didn't listen to them in, in actuality. Okay, so even though you're exempt because you theoretically would have listened to Basin when you mixed up the pieces of meat, you, since you didn't actively listen to them, you don't make it that the majority of the people listen to them and that they have to bring the korban. Mm -hmm. My time of why? Amakra bishkaga, akukula bishkaga achat. All of the people have to be following Basin in the same way. So since they were actively following Basin and you only theoretically would have followed Basin, you don't combine to define the majority of the team. Okay. Whether he did it, whether they did it and he followed them, or whether they didn't do it at all, etc. So the Lord says, Lamli the Misni call honey. Why does it say all these? Not only this, even this. 
not only if they actively did it and he did it with them, is he exempt, but even if they didn't do it at all and he did it, he's exempt. But the end, we're speaking about the cases where he actually knows better. It should, if we're talking about Lozu, uh, you know, lo, you know, you know, Lozu Afzu, it should have said not only if he did it on his own, even if he did it with them, since he knows better, he's still Chayyim. Fine. The end of the case is the it's stylistically the same. The order, and rather than saying not only this, even this case, not only this case, even this case, it's saying in this case he's chayav, and obviously in these other cases he's chayav. Okay. So anyway, moving on. Now we get to the interesting next case. Somebody knows better, then he's not relying on them, um, and then he's supposed to follow his own conscience. Okay, not set himself up as a competing authority, but follow his own conscience. Tarti Lamali. Now, why does it say one of them or Talmud Veroy or no Tarti? I think Talmud Veroy Lahora. The double language of Talmud Veroy Lahora. Okay, so the, why is it sort of saying both? Um, so it says, um, uh, right. So the Mar says, I'm a Rava Itzrich. Sagadai to Kamina Hanimili Gummer Vesavir. If it just said Talmud, maybe I would have said that somebody has to be fully fit to be on the court, which means both Gummer, they know all of the relevant information, and Savir, they have good analytic skills, okay, and good judgment, right? Because you need both. You need to know the substance of the law, and you need to have a good lawyerly mind and whatever, and you know, you have to have good analytical skills. So only that person can I say is really acting, not really following them. Of a gummy low. But if somebody just knows the law but isn't good in terms of like analysis, I might think at the end of the day, he really is following them. Like I say to myself, look, I'm not as big as sages as they are, but I know the law and I think that they're making an obvious mistake here in the law. You could say that if I decide in the end to follow them, what I'm really doing is I'm really sort of saying like, at the end of the day, I'm not saying I know they're wrong and I'm following them. I say like, they probably know better than I do. You know, they're, they're, they're smarter, they're more analytical, even though it looks to me like they're going against an explicit ruling. So maybe in that case, it's considered to be that I'm not going on my own authority. I actually genuinely am sort of, um, you know, uh, um, like, um, you know, sub not just submitting to their authority, but trusting in their judgment over my judgment. Okay, so there, and therefore the Kiddush is that no, even in that case, if I think that they're going against the law that I know is clear, even if I think they're smarter than me or whatever, and I don't have strong analytical skills, at the end of the day, I'm not following their judge. You know, I'm not relying on them. I know better. Um, okay, so how do you have a gummy? I'm really a bai lahora gummy versavir mashma. So what do you mean? How can you say that? Roy lahora means that he that he has all the qualities, both knowledge and analytical skills, and that's the only case we're talking about. So Rava said back to him, If it had just said Talmud, meaning the whole phrase you're right, doesn't suggest what I'm saying. I'm learning what I'm saying from the from the replic from the duplication of the language. If it had just said Talmud, I would have said it meant you have all the qualities. You both have the knowledge and the analytical skills. Um uh Tana. Royal Hora, so it has an extra phrase, Royal Hora, Mishnya Seira, Afilu Gummy below Savir, Savir below Gummyer. The extra, it's so fun, it's like Aim Yira Hamira, little Rabbos type of thing. You know, because it's more explicit and it says fit to rule, it really means you have qualities that would make you fit to rule even if they're not complete. So either you have really good analytic skills or you have really good knowledge, even though you only have half of the full package, okay? Nevertheless, that is sufficient to say that when you go ahead and they give a ruling and you say, you know what, I'm just going to listen to them, that really you do deep down know better, okay? And you can't say that because they both have knowledge and analytical skills and I only have one, I'm really trusting them. No, you're not really trusting them. You really do know better and you're just listening to them even though you know you shouldn't be, okay? Which is interesting because actually if you ask me, I totally get that idea. Like, you know, to me it looks obvious that something is one way, but I, if I know somebody is much more knowledgeable than I am or much more, but has much more better analytic skills, they probably understand something about this that I don't and I'm genuinely going to trust them. But the is going to say, if it looked to you, you have at least one of those qualities and to you it looks like they're making a mistake, then... You we, then you should not have done that. You should have followed your own conscience. Okay, so Roy Lora, Kigon Mana, who follow, falls in this category of somebody fit to give sock? Amarava Kigon Shimon Ben Azai and Shimon Ben Zoma. So those were two people that were like 
big clerks of the court, Talmidim sitting in front of the main court of the Sanhedrin, and they could have been on the court, but they, they, you know there just wasn't a vacancy, but they were fit to be on the court. So Amalia Baye, Kia Gavna, amazing. I, I don't get it. If they're fit to be on the court, now you could have asked that from the mission itself. The mission says one of them knows they're wrong. One of the court itself knows they're wrong. So Bai says, why is it if you yourself are on the court or fit to be on the court and know that they're making a mistake and you listen to them, why do you bring a court bond? You should be considered a willful violator of the law. You know they're in error. Okay, where's your mistake? So um, I get why you're not exempt, but why, why, you know, you're amazing. You're more liable. You're not, you don't, you don't get to bring a court bond. One minute we have a bright that says explicitly this. If you make your own mistake, you bring a korban. If you're following based on your exempt, Kate said, what's the case? One of them knows there's making a mistake. Somebody who's sitting in front of them and is fit to be on the court. Maybe even in that case, you're exempt for listening then. If at the end of the day you're following, you know better and you're doing it, you're chayv a korban. Whereas based in, if you don't know better and you're following them, pater, you're exempt. So So what's the example? Kigon, the other the also, if they're so if they know based on making a mistake, what makes them a shogate? So kigon, the other the also, yes, you know that it's forbidden. So why are you a shogate? The katai be mitzvah and the error that they're making is that they think that you have to listen to the sages even if they're wrong. So, so here's the case. This is so relevant for how we think what makes halacha. Because everybody knows the famous Rashi that says, right, when it says, Lo tosri yaminu smo, don't sway to the right or the left. Rashi says, Afilu omin lacha yamin shu smo ba smo shu yamin. Even if it looks like they're telling you that your right hand is your left hand and your left hand is your right hand. Right? So that makes it sound like even when you know they're making a mistake, you listen to them. And here the Gemara is saying explicitly that's not true. Now, maybe that's true for a lay person, because a lay person could think they're making a mistake and a lay person doesn't know better. But if you're fit to be on the court, and in your mind they're making a mistake, it is wrong to think that you're supposed to, that they're supposed to follow them even when they make an error. That's what you think. You think you're supposed to do that, okay? And therefore, when you ate this chelev, you were not a willful violator of the chelev. You actually thought that you had per permission to eat it. You thought that the court's ruling always is authoritative, even in the face of error. Now, the funny thing is, like that gets to this question. One minute, isn't that true? Meaning, if the if it's an if if like, isn't their interpretation always binding? And that again gets to the case that no, that there are some cases where we can say their interpretation is objectively wrong. One of those cases is not clear. But if there are cases where we can say it's objectively wrong, and you know that to be the case then you do not listen to them. Even though it says don't sway to the right or the left, it does not apply to a case when they're objectively wrong. Which then again just begs the question, then what's so bad about the Zok in Mamre? Mm -hmm. And the answer is what's bad about him is that he positioned himself as a competing authority. Okay, but exactly, but to actually just follow your own conscience when you know they're wrong, that's what you're required to do. So there's a whole range of cases, right? There's a case where it's like, I think they're wrong. As far as I understand this, Allah, they're making a mistake, but they're smarter than me. I'm just going to rely on them. And the Gemara says, like, actually, if you really are knowledgeable enough to know that they're wrong, even if a little bit you're sort of like saying, oh, they're smarter than me, that itself is considered to be relying on yourself and not relying mm -hmm. on them. And in that case, you actually bring a Corbin as well. And then there's a case where, like, say, I absolutely know they're wrong, but I think I'm supposed to listen to them anyway. That also is a case where you're, at the end of the day, not just following them, not just relying on them, okay? And you also bring a korban, okay? Because you yourself know better, and the fact that you think you're supposed to listen to them is just really a mistake, okay? So those are cases where you are a shogate, but not a shogate of peahem. You're making a mistake, but at the end of the day, you should have known better, and you're seen as acting on your own authority. Okay, so now it says like this, this is the principle. If you rely on yourself, you're chayiv. Let's say somebody says, I don't, I don't accept the authority of the court. Okay, I think they're always making mistakes. I regularly reject their rulings. So if they go ahead and they say, I don't know, they, you know, they say, uh, means all meat and milk. And I say, yeah, they don't know what they're talking about. As long as it's not a kid goat and smothers milk, and I go ahead and I eat general buster bakalam, and I do other things. Then they come along and they say, oh, actually, it's mutter in this type of a case to eat this fat. And I say, oh, great, I like that sock. I'm going to follow it. So in that case, 
since you are deciding now to listen to them, and in general, we see an attitude that you're making decisions for yourself, you don't submit to their authority. So even now, you're doing this is not an insubmission to their authority. You have positioned yourself as somebody who generally just makes your own decisions and doesn't listen to their rulings. So now that you're listening to their rulings, we don't say that that's because of a stance of following them. In the end, it's because you've decided on your own you want to do it. Okay, and therefore you would be chayav. Um, so totally be based in lasuye. Now, what's the what are we including when we say anybody who relies on based in is exempt? Who are based in v'yosha tov? The chazu So a case where you followed based in, but you were following based in after based in had retracted. Just the word didn't get to you that they retracted. Mm. You got it? Based in said it was okay to eat this thing. You heard that initial ruling. You went home two days later and you ate it. By the time you got home, they had retracted, but you hadn't heard of the retraction. In that case, since in your mind you were following them, even though in practice the psak was no longer binding, okay, you're still exempt. So the Gemara says, Habehedi Ketani Law. We're going to teach that in a minute in the following Mishnah. Tani Vahadim Farish. Okay, we're going to teach it and we're, yes, fine, it's implicit in this Mishnah, it's going to be explicit in the next. Let's just read a tiny bit more. This idea that everybody could be exempt, an individual follows based in, based in is exempt, it's not the majority of the tzibur, the individual is exempt, he's following based in, that's the position of Reb Yehuda. But the sages say, that any time based in doesn't bring a korban, you would bring a korban. So even though you are a total innocent person who has total emunas chachamim, and you listened to them, and you trusted them, and you followed it, and you're blameless, since they're not bringing a korban, because it's only the minority of the community, not the, not the majority of Kla Yisrael, since they're not bringing a korban, and an Avera was done, you're going to bring the korban. Now this is important, because it gets to the question David was asking before. There's a general assumption that the reason you bring a korban is that you had some guilt, some fault, the sin was, you know, you're some degree blameworthy. We focus very much on this personal sense of guilt, and I'm coming to atone for my personal guilt, okay? And actually, in the Torah, it's much less about your personal guilt. It's much less about the fact that when a sin is done, it creates some, like, metaphysical rupture in the world, or it brings some tumor to the world, mm -hmm. right? And therefore, that bad stuff out there has to be fixed, right? So it's not so much, I don't care whether you're to, to blame, like what, I care that you're the cause of it. If you walk into a store and you accidentally knock something over and you break it, it's like, I don't care if that was an accident. I don't care if you're blameless. You break it, you clean it up, you know? you know. So therefore, if so that's the idea here is I totally am innocently followed the court. But since it's a, not a circumstance that the court brings a court bun, because it's only an individual, not the majority. So at the end of the day, it was my act. I have to, I made a mess. I clean it up. Even if I have no fault for it and no blame, it's like the Gemara's idea that if somebody is a Tino Shanishba, an infant is taken captive, grows up thinking they're not Jewish. They finally, at the end of 40 years, realizes that they're Jewish. They have to bring a korban for all of their Shechul Shabbos. And not one korban for every Shabbos, maybe one korban for all the Shabbos. But why are they bringing anything? They're totally blameless. Their whole life they thought that they were, you know, Christian or whatever. So the answer is, it's not about blame. It's about you did it. Somebody's got to bring a korban. Somebody's got to sweep up all the broken glass. So what? We should Somebody else should sweep up the glass? You sweep up the glass, okay? So that is a very important idea about korbanot. And this is what we actually say, that the position of the chachamim is not that is not that everybody gets off, even though you were blameless, you still have to bring a korban. Okay, and let's just read one more sentence. We'll end here, I know we're a little over, but my Reb Yehuda, you know, let's end here, okay? So, because then it's going to get into, we'll have to figure out how to uh, catch up, but okay, we're already behind, great start. Okay, <laughs> but we got a lot of very important ideas down, so we will continue with this tomorrow, what?